Story fourteen of Abaft the Funnel by Rudyard Kipling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story fourteen The Likes of Us. It was the general officer commanding, riding down the mall, on the Arab with the perky tail, and he condescended to explain some of the mysteries of his profession. But the point on which he dwelt most pompously was the ease with which the private Thomas Atkins could be handled, as he called it. "'Only feed him and give him a little work to do, and you can do anything with him,' said the general officer commanding. "'There's no refinement about Tommy, you know, and one is very like another. They've all the same ideas and traditions and prejudices. They're all big children.' fancy any man in his senses shooting about these hills there was the report of a shotgun in the valley i suppose they've hit a dog happy as the day is long when they're out shooting dogs just like a big child is tommy he touched up his horse and cantered away there was a sound of angry voices down the hillside all right you sir i won't never forget this mind you not as long as i live and so help me out the sentence finished in what would be represented by a blaze of asterisks. A deeper voice cut it short. "'Oh, no, you won't, neither. Look a here, you young smitcher. If I was to take you up now and knock off your head again that tree, could you say anything? No, nor yet do anything. If I was to—' "'Ah, you would, would you? There!' Someone had evidently sat down with a thud and was swearing nobly. I slid over the edge of the cud, down through the long grass, and fetched up, after the manner of a sledge, with my feet in the broad of the back of Gunner Barnabas in the mountain battery, my friend, the very strong man. He was sitting upon a man, a khaki-coloured volcano of blasphemy, and was preparing to smoke. My sudden arrival threw him off his balance for a moment, then, readjusting his chair, he bade me good day. M and me have been having an argument," said Gunner Barnabas placidly. "I was going for to half kill and heave him into the bushes here, but seeing that you have come, sir, and very welcome when you do come, we will have a court martial instead. Sherlock, are you willing?" The volcano, who had been swearing uninterruptedly through this oration expressed a desire in general and particular terms to see gunner barnabas in torment and the civilian on the next gridiron private shacklock was a tow-haired scrofulous boy of about two and twenty his nose was bleeding profusely and the live air attested that he had been drinking quite as much as was good for him he lay stomach down on a little level spot on the hillside for gunner barnabas was sitting between his shoulder blades and his was not a weight to wriggle under private shacklock could barely draw breath to swear but he did the best that in him lay amen said gunner barnabas piously when an unusually brilliant string of oaths came to an end seeing that this gentleman here has never seen the inside of the hospitals you've gotten in and the clinks you've been chucked into like a pay bundle perhaps private shacklock you will stop you are a makin o him sick private shacklock said that he was pleased to hear it and would have continued his speech but his breath suddenly went from him and the unfinished curse died out in a gasp gunner barnabas had put up one of his huge feet there's just enough room now for you to breathe shacklock said he and not enough for you to try to interrupt the conversation i'm havin with this gentleman Joop! Turning to me, Gunner Barnabas pulled at his pipe, but showed no hurry to open the conversation. I felt embarrassed, for, after all, the thus strangely unearthed difference between the gunner and the lineman was no affair of mine. "'Don't you go,' said Gunner Barnabas. He had evidently been deeply moved by something. He dropped his head between his fists and looked steadily at me. I met this child here, said he, at Delali, a fishback recruity as ever was. I knowed him at Delali, and I give him a latherin at Delali, all for to keep him straight, e being such as wants a latherin and knowin nothin of the ways of this country. Then I meets him up here, a butterfly huntin as innocent as you please, 
convalescin'. I goes out with him, butterfly huntin', and as you see here, a shootin'. The gun betwixt us. I saw then what I had overlooked before, a company fowling piece lying among some boulders far down the hill. Gunner Barnabas continued, I should have been where he had a been to get that drink inside of him. Presently, e misses summat. You're a bloomin' fool, says I. If that had been a pathin' now, I says, damn your pathins and you too, says he. I struck it. You did not, I says. I saw the bark fly. Stick to your bloomin' pop gun, says he, and don't talk to a better man than you. I laughed there, knowin' what I was and what he was. You laugh, says he. I laugh, I says, Shacklock, and for what should I not laugh, says I. Then go and laugh in hell, says he, for I'll have none of your laughin. With that he brings up the gun yonder and looses off, and I stretches him there and give him a little to keep him quiet, and puts him under, and while I was thinkin' what next, you comes down the hill and finds us as we was. The private was the gunner's prey. I knew that the affair had fallen as the gunner had said, for my friend is constitutionally incapable of lying, and I recognized that in his hands lay the boy's fate. "'What do you think?' said Gunner Barnabas, after a silence broken only by the convulsive breathing of the boy he was sitting on. "'I think nothing,' I said. "'He didn't go at me. He's your property.' Then an idea occurred to me. "'Hand him over to his own company. They'll school him half dead.' "'Got no company,' said Gunner Barnabas. "'He's a convalescent draft. All sixes and sevens. Don't matter to them what he did.' Thrash him yourself, then, I said. Gunner Barnabas looked at the man and smiled, then caught up an arm as a mother takes up the dimpled arm of a child, and ran the sleeve and shirt up to the elbow. Look at that, he said. It was a pitiful arm, lean and muscleless. Can you mill a man with an arm like that, such as I would like to mill him, and such as he deserves? I tell you, sir, and I am not smoking, swaggering. As you see, I could take that man, soldier he is, Lord help him, and twist off his arms and his legs as if he was a naked crab. See here. Before I could realize what was going to happen, Gunner Barnabas rose up, stooped, and taking the wretched private shacklock by two points of grasp, heaved him up above his head. The boy kicked once or twice, and then was still. He was very white. I could now, said Gunner Barnabas, I could now chuck this man where I like, chuck him like a lump of beef, and it would not be too much for him if I chucked. Can I thrash such a man with both hands? No, nor yet with my right hand tied behind my back, and my left in a sling. He dropped Private Shacklock on the ground, and sat upon him as before. The boy groaned as the weight settled, but there was a look in his white-lashed red eyes that was not pleasant. "'I do not know what I will do,' said Gunner Barnabas, rocking himself to and fro. "'I know his breed, and the way o' the likes o' them. If I was in his company, and this had happened, and I had struck him as I would ha' struck him, twould ha' all passed off and been forgot till the drink was in him again, a month maybe, or six maybe. And when the drink was frizzin in his head, he would up and loose off in the night or the day or the evenin, all acause of that millin that e would a have gotten in between. That I would be dead, killed by the likes o him and me, the next strongest man but three in the British army. Private Shacklock, not so hardly pressed as he had been, found breath to say that if he could only get hold of the fowling piece again, the strongest man but three in the British army would be seriously crippled for the rest of his days. "'Hear that?' said Gunner Barnabas, sitting heavily to silence his chair. "'Hear that, you that think things is funny to put into the papers? He would shoot me, he would, now. And so long as he's drunk, or coming out of the drink, he will want to shoot me. Look a here." He turned the boy's head sideways, his hand round the nape of the neck, his thumb touching the angle of the jaw. What do you call those marks? They were the white scars of scrofula, with which Shacklock was eaten up. I told Gunner Barnabas this. I don't know what that means. I call them murder marks and signs. 
If a man 'as these things on 'im and drinks so long as 'e's drunk, 'e's mad a loony. But that don't 'elp if 'e kills you. Look a here and here." The marks were thick on the jaw and neck. "'Stubbs at him,' said Gunner Barnabas to himself, "'and Lancy at him, and Duggard at him, and what's come of them?' "'You've got him,' he said, addressing himself to the man he was handling like a roped calf, "'and sooner or later you'll go with the rest of em. "'But this time I will not do anything, "'except and keep you here till the drinks deaden you.' Gunner Barnabas resettled himself and continued, "'Twice this afternoon, Shacklock, you have been so near dying that I know no man more so. Once, when I stretched you, and I might have wiped up your face with my boot as you was lying, and once it was when I lifted you up in my fists. Was you afraid, Shacklock?' "'I were,' murmured the half-stifled soldier. "'And once more I will show you how near you can go to kingdom come in my hands.' He knelt by Shacklock's side, the boy lying still as death. "'If I was to hit you here,' said he, "'I would break your chest and you would die. "'If I was to put my hand here and my other hand here, "'I would twist your neck and you would die, private Shacklock. "'If I was to put my knees here and put your head so, "'I would pull off your head, private Shacklock, and you would die. "'If you think as how I am a liar, say so and I'll show you. "'Do you think so?' "'No.' whispered Private Shacklock, not daring to move a muscle, for Barnabas's hand was on his neck. "'Now remember,' went on Barnabas, "'neither you will say nothing, nor I will say nothing, of what has happened. I have put you to shame before me, and this gentleman here, and that is enough. But I tell you, and you give heed now, it would be better for you to desert than to go on a servant where you are now. If I meet you again—' If my battery lays with your regiment and Private Shacklock is on the rolls, I will first mill you myself till you can't see, and then I will say why I struck you. You must go and look bloom and slippy about it, for if you stay, so sure as God made pathons, and we've got to wipe em out, you'll be loosing off a unauthorized ammunition in or out of barracks, and you'll be hanged for it. I know your breed, and I know what these here white marks mean. You're a mad, Shacklock, that's all, and here you stay under me, and now choop, and lie still. I waited and smoked, and Gunner Barnabas smoked till the shadows lengthened on the hillside, and a chilly wind began to blow. At dusk Gunner Barnabas rose and looked at his captive. Drinks out of him now, he said. I can't move, whimpered Shacklock. I, I've got the fever back again. I'll carry you, said Gunner Barnabas, swinging him up and preparing to climb the hill. Good night, sir, he said to me. It looks pretty, doesn't it? But never you forget, and I won't forget neither, that this here shiverin', shakin', convalescent a hangin' on my neck is a ragin', tearin' devil when he's lushy, and he a boy. He strode up to the hill with his burden, but just before he disappeared, he turned round and shouted, it's the likes o' him bring shame on the likes o' us. Tain't we ourselves, so help me God, tain't. End of story 14